Hello, and welcome to a lecture on magnetic flux density. My name is Steve Ellingson. So here's an overview of this lecture. The magnetic flux density, which we assign the symbol B, boldface B, indicating that it is a vector, is a fundamental quantity in electromagnetics. So first, what we're going to talk about is what it means to be a magnetic field. I think you already know it has something to do with permanent magnets, and perhaps you also know it has something to do with current. Then we're going to talk specifically about magnetic flux density, which is simply one way that we quantify the magnetic field. Now you may recall that we talked about the electric field, and one way to quantify the electric field is as electric field intensity. So we're doing a similar thing here. We acknowledge that there is this thing called the magnetic field. We're looking for ways to describe it. The magnetic flux density, B, is simply one way to describe it. And finally, we'll talk about permeability. Permeability is analogous to permittivity for electric fields. It describes how materials influence the magnetic field. So first, a permanent magnet. A permanent magnet creates a vector field. You can verify this for yourself. For example, you can take a bar magnet. Here's a bar magnet consisting of a south pole and a north pole. And you arrange another bar magnet next to it. This one, I have the south pole over here and the North Pole over here, and you know that these uh, ends of these two different magnets will attract each other. From this point, we see a force pulling the magnet towards the North Pole of the other magnet. And if I rotate that around and I put the North Pole here and the South Pole here, you know that North repels North, and here I would see a force uh, repelling the magnet from the other magnet. So I have a vector field here Certainly force in this case is a vector field, which is somehow associated with this phenomenon of magnetism. The same thing happens with current. Here's an experiment where I am simply replacing one of the bar magnets with a coil, and the coil is being fed with a current source. So current is flowing into this coil and out the other side, and the result is a magnetic field. We know this because if we bring in the other magnet, we see that this coil here acts just like the original magnet. In fact, if I drew a curtain right here, you would not be able to tell whether I had a coil back there or another magnet. They work exactly the same, or at least I can make them work exactly the same, so you would not know whether it was that I had a permanent magnet behind the curtain or a coil behind the curtain. And of course, if I rotate the bar magnet, as I've indicated here, then the force uh, is repulsive. Once again, this magnet can't tell the difference between another bar magnet and an appropriately designed coil. Here's a graphic which shows how we quantify the magnetic field and also explains some curious behaviors of the magnetic field. So for the moment, I'm just going to simply say that I've got a magnetic flux density, a vector field, which is spatially uniform. It's the same all points in space. It's always pointing in this direction as indicated by these arrows. And I'm not going to say how I figured that out yet. I'm simply going to assume the presence of such a field. And then I'm going to describe an experiment. In this experiment, I have a charged particle, that positively charged particle right there. And it is motionless in space. V, the velocity vector, is equal to zero. So if I do this, if I have this spatially uniform magnetic field, I have a charged particle existing in the field, and it's not moving, I find that situation is pretty boring. The force on the particle is zero. Now let me do just one more thing. I'll take this particle and I'll start moving it out of the plane of the screen here. In other words, in this graphic here, the particle is moving towards you, away from the screen. As soon as the velocity is different from zero, I get a force. And in this case, the force is in this direction. So velocity out of the screen towards the viewer for a magnetic field, which is oriented in this direction, somehow results in a force pointing in this direction. So let me show you what the rule turns out to be. It is that this force is given by the charge of the particle, the velocity vector, in this case v in the direction out of the screen, which I'm calling z hat here, cross, it's a cross product, with the magnetic flux density. And in fact, this is a defining relationship, or at least we can interpret this as a defining relationship for magnetic flux density. 
I can go into some region, I can take the test charge, I can start moving it in different directions, see what the force is, and then at each point solve for the magnetic flux density, and that's a perfectly reasonable definition of the magnetic flux density. Not necessarily the one we would always use, but is one way to, to define the relationship. So a couple things should strike you as mysterious here, especially with respect to the way the electric field worked. The magnetic field, the force turns out to be dependent on speed. In other words, the force we see on the particle depends on how fast the particle is moving. There was no such relationship for the electric field. For the electric field, just to remind you, force was charge times electric field intensity, simply proportional. Here, it depends on speed. Force turns out to be perpendicular to velocity. This is also strange. In other words, given a velocity vector, a direction of motion and a speed, and the magnetic flux density, force turns out to be perpendicular to both the magnetic flux density vector and the velocity vector. Why should that be? There is no simple answer from classical physics. You need to go a little bit deeper into modern physics to figure out exactly why this is. I'll give you a hint, and it has to do with the fact that the electric field and the magnetic field are really the same fundamental force. They're the electromagnetic force. They are aspects of the electromagnetic force. But to understand why the magnetic field should work this way and the electric field should work in some other way, you have to dig a little bit deeper. We don't need those concepts for this course. For us, it's fine just to acknowledge this as a reality and start working from that point. The final note I'll make here is that I've been using this term magnetic flux density. Now, when we were talking about the electric field, we talked about the electric field intensity. And now we're talking about a magnetic flux density. So clearly, we have some other interpretation in mind here for how the field works. And that's true. Just hold that thought, and we'll come back to that later in this lecture. So a little dimensional analysis, uh, and this will lead us to perhaps some insight in this business of the interpretation of the magnetic field as a flux. So once again, the equation force is given by the charge of the particle times the velocity of the particle cross product with the magnetic flux density. That's a defining relationship for B. Now what are the units of B? Well, we can figure this out from dimensional analysis. Units of force are newtons, at least SI base units. The units of charge are coulombs. The units of velocity are meters per second. So now I can solve for the units of B. They turn out to be Newton seconds over Coulomb meters, which are pretty strange looking units. They're so strange that we don't really like to use those. We come up with a shorthand, and the shorthand SI base unit is T, which stands for Tesla. So one Tesla is one Newton second per Coulomb meter, and that's the magnetic flux density. So what makes this a flux density? I probably have described in a previous lecture the fact that flux is a technical term for a flow. So when we say flux density, we're really referring to the density of something which is flowing, or at least we're interpreting it as a flow. So what happens here is we frequently find in this business, in engineering electromagnetics, we frequently find that useful answers are obtained by integrating B over a surface. In other words, we'll see over and over again that the result of some calculation depends on doing this integration. That is an integral over some surface. Now, if that's a calculation we're going to do over and over again, then we should recognize that this thing looks like a flux density, right? If we're calculating something over a surface, that's a total flow. So we can think of this as a flow per unit area. So flow per unit area times area gives us flow. And that's what we mean by a flux density in this case. If you're looking for another example to try to make sense of this, I would suggest thinking of the current in a wire, which is also a flux. It's a flux of charge carriers. So what do I mean by that? Well, think of a cylinder which is, in this case, could be a wire, and I have current flowing through the wire. The total current is amps. So I say I have so many amps flowing through the wire. But then you could ask the question, well, how many amps are there in a certain cross-section of the wire? And that would be amps per meter squared. So in this case, 
amps current is the flux and amps per meter squared is the flux density and if I want the total current in the wire then what would I do I would integrate over the cross section of the wire the current density which we give the symbol J dot DS this would have units of amps per meter squared and then this would have units of amps and that's another physical example that should help you understand the concept of a flux density it just turns out that the magnetic field is most naturally described also as a flux density, again, because we keep finding ourselves doing this calculation. Okay, so now if we're going to call B a magnetic flux density, a flux density, then really we should also ask the question, what is the associated flux? In other words, we just said the units of the flux density are teslas, newton seconds per coulomb meter. But if B is a flux density, then really the unit should also be expressible in terms of something divided by meters squared, something divided by area. And that something is magnetic flux, Weber's. So in SI base units, one Tesla can also be expressed as flux, that is magnetic flux, divided by area. So Weber's divided by meters squared. Uh, we use both sets of units fairly interchangeably. Uh, there's no one preference for one or the other, except sometimes it's useful to think of Weber's. By the way, you've encountered Weber's before, perhaps in the context of inductance. Inducti uh, inductance in Henry's turns out to be a Weber per amp of current. And in fact, we're going to come back to that idea later. We will occasionally talk about magnetic field lines. What does that mean? Well, it simply means this. At each point in space, I could find the direction of a magnetic field line using the defining relationship that we've been talking about, force equals Q V cross B. In other words, I can go to each point in space and find out what the magnetic flux density vector looks like, what direction it's pointing in its magnitude. Well, let's say I go here and I find it's pointing this way. Well, if I move to the next position in that direction, and I calculate it again, I find it's this way. And I can repeat that procedure to trace out a line. In other words, a magnetic field line is determined by always moving in the direction in which the magnetic field is pointing at each point, and then recalculating the magnetic field direction, and then following its path. The remarkable thing about magnetic field lines is they always form closed loops. So if you do this exercise on a bar magnet, as I've done here, you'll find that you trace out a path that does this if you start here. If you start here, you'll find that you trace out a path that looks like this. If you start here, you'll find you trace out a path that looks like this and so on. And these magnetic field lines, oddly enough, always close on themselves. So that's a key idea, and we'll come back to that later in the course. Well, we know that current creates the same phenomenon as bar magnets, as permanent magnets. And in fact, I can design a coil that will behave just like a bar magnet in the sense it will create the same magnetic fields. So also for a coil, the magnetic field lines form closed loops. It really doesn't matter what the source of the magnetic field was, it should always form a closed loop. Now I'd like to address the question of how to calculate the magnetic flux density directly. Note that the defining relationship that we've been using does not tell us how to calculate B. Sure, I can go to each point in space, calculate the force due to some test charge moving at some velocity, and then solve this equation for B. That's pretty tedious, and I have to do the experiment because I would have to find out what the force was. What I'd really like is something that tells me directly in terms of the source, charge and motion, what the magnetic flux density is. So here it is for a charged particle. We'll start off with the simplest possible thing. For a charged particle, I can calculate the magnetic flux density directly using this expression. The magnetic flux density for a charged particle is given by the magnitude of the charge, its velocity, and then this term, which you should recognize as being the inverse square law. Interestingly, the magnetic flux density magnitude decreases according to the inverse square law, just like the electric field intensity decreases with distance squared following the inverse square law. Okay, I take this much. I take the cross product with r hat. What is that? Well, here's my particle. 
Here's the field point. Okay, so source over here, field point over here. This vector is r hat r, right? Here's r, and then r hat points from the source to the field point. So I take the cross product with the unit vector, which points from the source to the field point, and then I multiply by one other constant here, mu. And I think you can anticipate that mu is going to represent the effect of the material because it's the only thing we haven't counted for yet. We can learn something about mu by doing dimensional analysis. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. B has units of Weber's per meter squared. I could have used Tesla here, but I have some advanced knowledge of how this is going to work out. So I'm going to start off with Weber's per meter squared. Q, units of Coulombs. V, units of meters per second. This term, the inverse square law, units of 1 over meters squared. R is a unit vector, so it has no units. The cross product doesn't change units. So whatever I have here has to be dimensionally consistent with everything else. Now, if I look at coulombs per second, that's amps. That's current, right? One coulomb per second is one amp. And if I take meters, divide by meters squared, I get 1 over meters. So what I need here is something that has meters again in the denominator, because I need meters squared on the left-hand side. And then amps times something should give me Weber's. And as I showed you before, amps times Henry's, units of inductance, give me Weber's. So this quantity has units of Henry's per meter, and this is the thing that describes the effective material in determining the magnetic field. We call that not permittivity, that's a mistake. We call that permeability. And as we've just seen, that has units of Henry's per meter, describes the effect of the material. Now, just a word of caution here. Sometimes people look at those units, Henry's per meter, and they feel like it should be inductance per unit length because the units of inductance are Henry's. So uh, is this inductance per unit length? Well, not really. And the reason it isn't really inductance per unit length is because inductance is the ability to store energy in a magnetic field. And that's really a property of a structure. In other words, to store a magnetic field, you need both a material and a structure in which to store the energy. Whereas this is an intrinsic property of the material. Any quantity of a material has the same permeability, so many Henry's per meter. So the best you can say about this is it, that it pertains to the storage of magnetic energy, the ability of some material to store magnetic energy once you assemble it into a structure that's capable of doing that. So let's say a little bit more about permeability. First, in free space, that is the simplest possible medium, the permeability is given the symbol mu naught. That's the permeability of free space. For the units that we use here, for SI base units, it turns out that permeability of free space is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7th Henry's per meter. People sometimes wonder why this 4 pi pops out. Why should it be a factor of pi? That simply has to do with the units. You could also write this, of course, as 1.257 micro Henry's per meter. It's your choice. And once again, this is the minimum permeability that any material can have. Anything other than free space is going to have more substance in it, and that results in a greater ability to store magnetic energy. Permeabilities of most common materials are just slightly greater than mu naught. In fact, nearly all materials have permeability, which is just very, very slightly greater than that of free space. And so for most materials, we'll be able to say simply that the permeability is mu naught. There are some materials which have permeabilities which are significantly different from that of free space. And typically when that happens, it's different by a lot. Those materials are commonly referred to as magnetic materials. Now that doesn't mean that materials are already magnetized. It simply means that these are materials which have relatively high permeabilities and can be used to create structures which can store a lot of magnetic energy. The most common example of these, or the most well-known example of these, are ferromagnetic materials, the most important example of which is iron. Uh, I'm showing here in chemical notation. Fe is iron. So iron is a ferromagnetic material, and it has a very high permeability. Of course, alloys of iron, nickel, 
cobalt. These are all things which can result in materials that have very high permeability. Steel has relatively high permeability. But once again, most materials, and certainly most materials which are not uh, metallic or ferrite of some kind, tend to have permeabilities which are, again, very close to mu naught. And just as in the case of permittivity, we frequently refer to relative permeability. In other words, we don't like to keep saying what the permeability is because we have these extreme values to deal with. Instead, what we do is we take the actual permeability and we divide it by that of free space, and then we can express things in terms of relative permeability. So in other words, most materials have a relative permeability, which is about one or very slightly greater than one. And then ferromagnetic materials have relative permeabilities, which are much greater than one. That concludes this lecture on magnetic flux density.